protest against the government's treatment of the Civil Rights Disabled Persons Bill. I've come here because it's important to support the rights bill. I mean, the government has got no respect for us. We have to respect them, but they don't respect and recognize our rights concerning the bill, us deaf people. And the President of the United States has a message for deaf people about his government's attitude to civil rights. I believe that being deaf or having any disability is not tragic, but the stereotypes attached to it are tragic. Discrimination is tragic. More from President Clinton later in the program. But first, on Monday, he'll be one of many world leaders who gather in northern France to mark the 50th anniversary of D-Day. The 6th of June 1944 was the day British and US forces and their allies began the invasion of Western Europe, which, with the Russians advancing from the east, eventually led to the crushing of Hitler's Nazi Germany. Tens of thousands of soldiers were killed. On Monday, more than 30,000 who survived will be revisiting the scene. They've been planning it for years, but earlier this spring, it looked as if some of the war veterans' plans would be shattered. This report from ITN begins with memories of the D-Day landings in Normandy. This is London. D-Day has come. Early this morning, the Allies began the assault on the northwestern face of Hitler's European fortress. More than 30,000 veterans are expected to return to the Normandy beaches this summer on the anniversary of D-Day, the start of Operation Overlord, the campaign that ended the Second World War in Europe. But the celebrations for former paratrooper Angus Cross have already been soured. Months after paying deposits on hotel rooms in France for 114 Canadian comrades, he received a letter saying they were being cancelled to make way for French officials. I just can't comprehend it. Uh, it wouldn't happen in Britain, would it? Angus Cross was today remembering those who died in the D-Day campaign. He says it's scandalous that the survivors are now being treated so badly by the country they helped to liberate. Fortunately, the French government changed its mind and the veterans' hotel bookings were restored. On this side of the channel, the British government too had to backtrack on some of its original plans for D-Day because they smack too much of a party and not enough of a commemoration of those who fought and died. When the plan was launched in April, the Prime Minister did emphasize that first and foremost, it should be a commemoration and a thank you to all who helped with the victory. The first half of giving thanks is to give thanks to them for their part in the enterprise. Secondly, it's a more general theme, to give thanks for the fact that it was successful, for if it hadn't been, the sort of country we live in the sort of world we live in wouldn't remotely have been the same. No one could disagree with that. If Hitler's Nazis had won the war, life would have been intolerable for countless millions. Others wouldn't have survived at all. The slaughter of millions of Jewish people is well known. What's not so often mentioned is that the Nazis had no time for people of any other race or kind that they thought was inferior. This included Slavs from Eastern Europe, black people, gypsies, and minorities such as homosexuals. All of these could find themselves in concentration camps, which were often death camps. People with disabilities and deaf people were also treated with contempt. Numbers of them were killed, and many, including deaf people, were sterilized, so that they could not have children. The Allies freed Europe from that fear at the time, although there are signs of Nazism again raising its head in Germany and elsewhere. But although the direct threat may have been removed, many would question if this spirit of liberation has really been carried through to give full equal rights to all those groups who were oppressed. And that's where D-Day connects to our main story for this month. For us, every day is D-Day, Deaf Day. For millions of others, it's Disability Day. And if you're deaf or disabled, every day is also Discrimination Day. 
two months ago when we reported on the Civil Rights Disabled Persons Bill, there seemed grounds for cautious optimism. The bill had passed its second reading in the House of Commons. Not one MP voted against. But we did say not to get too carried away. At the same time as the government was planning the celebrations for D-Day, it was also plotting the downfall of the Civil Rights Bill. The bill is a private member's bill introduced by Roger Berry MP. As well as trying to end discrimination, it would also give people with disabilities legal rights that would help them obtain a fairer deal. But a private member's bill can only get through the House of Commons and onto the House of Lords before becoming law if MPs and particularly the government cooperate in giving it a safe passage. The Minister for the Disabled, Nicholas Scott, had already claimed that the cost of introducing this legislation would be too much, especially for employers. On Friday, May the 6th, when the bill came back to the House of Commons for what's called the report stage, five Tory backbenchers tabled a total of 80 amendments to the bill. This is a deliberate tactic used by MPs to block the progress of a bill. It means that there won't be enough time to discuss all the amendments, Therefore, not enough time for the House to agree to it. Sure enough, that afternoon, time ran out and the bill was held up. The accusation was made that the government had helped the blocking backbenchers by letting civil servants write the amendments for them. At first, Mr Scott denied this, but very quickly he was forced to own up, as News at 10 reported on May the 10th. In a near deserted House of Commons last Friday, Tory backbenchers like Lady Olga Maitland systematically set about destroying a private member's bill on the disabled. At the time, the Minister for the Disabled, Nicholas Scott, said neither he or the government had anything to do with it. But in front of a packed house today, he admitted that his department had, albeit indirectly, been involved in providing the ammunition to wreck the bill, contrary to his earlier statement. I very much regret that by not giving a fuller explanation at the time, the effect of my reply was misleading and I offered my unreserved apologies to the House. Lady Olga Maitland, the main mover of the amendments, was also forced to apologise to the House of Commons last week. Not for trying to block the bill, but for saying she had written the amendments herself, when in fact she hadn't but about blocking the bill, she remained unrepentant. There's been a lot of humbug in this. And what I think is very important, in my own view, I'd rather go through hell, I'd rather go through gunfire and get the right kind of legislation to really help the disabled. The six and a half million disabled people that she has ruined their lives, I, I can't put it more strongly than that, because they were hoping to get legislation so they would be treated like ordinary human beings. She was the one of the people who denied them that right. People with disabilities and deaf people reacted with fury. On Wednesday, May the 18th, hundreds gathered outside Nicholas Scott's department in Whitehall to demand, don't kill the bill. I was at the demonstration and I asked a number of the deaf people there what it was that had brought them out. I'm worried now because I think the government has set a very bad example. It's a horrible situation. What happens in the future? I think employers will behave in the same way. It's just hopeless. Two months ago, I didn't go to the Houses of Parliament. But I heard that a lot of deaf people did go there. That was good. Then the bill was approved by MPs of all parties. Great. Then a few weeks later it was scrapped. I was shocked and angry. 
And that's why I came here to support the lobby. I want more deaf people to really fight and hammer home their message. More campaigning of our MPs. Just write simple letters asking them to support the bill in Parliament and not ignore us. They'll find at the end of the day that they need our votes. A lot of Tory MPs are risking their seats. They'll be out the next election, I'm sure. And I'm a Tory voter and I'm saying it. The Tories will be out. But none of the protests had any effect on the government. On Friday, May the 20th, the Minister for the Disabled, Nicholas Scott, himself blocked the passage of the bill with another parliamentary tactic, filibustering. He just kept on talking till time ran out. It looks as if the bill is doomed to fall. The government says it is considering legislation on the issue, but the stumbling block it keeps putting forward is the cost to business and the economy. In part two, two people from the United States, the country with the world's biggest economy, talk about how legislation in the USA has helped deaf people and hasn't brought the economy grinding to a halt. One is a deaf attorney who's responsible for overseeing the Americans with Disabilities Act. The other is the President of the United States, Bill Clinton. Their comments for the first time on British television after the break. Robert Mather is an attorney with the United States Department of Justice. His job is to see that the Americans with Disabilities Act, which became law in 1992, is applied fairly. This act is often held up as an example for other countries to follow. Last month, the RNID and the British Deaf Association brought Robert Mather to Britain to address a series of public meetings on the need for disability legislation. We caught up with him in London on the same day as the demonstration we saw earlier. First, I asked him what the Americans with Disabilities Act had meant for deaf people in the United States. After the ADA was passed, more businesses and uh, government had seen us as people who happen to be deaf, who feel that an equal right and an equal access to programs should be the same as for others. And for the first time, we don't have to feel like we're out of place like we are in the right place. In the past, we had to ask for help. We had to show our need for interpreters or for text telephones or for flashing lights, special things. And what the ADA said is that these are not special things. These are your right, that people have the responsibility for treating you like an American and so people were very excited for us. Can you tell us how this was achieved? It will take years of experience working with different um, business communities and uh, trying to promote to uh, work within the law so that the business community can understand the needs for the legislation. Now, people, of course, wanted their rights, and so people with disabilities had to work with the business community in order to pass the law. And we're still putting in an effort to educate both individuals with disabilities and the business community as far as their rights and responsibilities. It is very challenging, and it's a very exciting time for all of us. So, how does the Americans with Disabilities Act work in practice? One example is that there was a pizza hut, and one of the managers had thought about buying a text telephone, or a, a TTY. He wondered if it would be good business. He wondered if he would get calls from the deaf community. So, he thought that um, he would buy one, and he publicized that he had a TDD number or TTY number. He got many calls for orders for pizzas and paid off the cost of the text telephone. So that's where it's one example where the ADA is pro-business. 
I mean, you're talking about millions and millions of Americans who happen to have disabilities, and now you're opening a new market to those people. Since the act became law, has life improved a lot for people as a result? I have two deaf children. Now, when I was small, I didn't know what kind of job I'd be able to get. Many people told me, you won't have a good job because you can't hear. And I dreamed of maybe being a factory worker, probably nothing beyond. Now, today, I have two children who are deaf. They have a variety of goals. They can be a doctor, they can be a computer programmer, or an attorney without thinking of their disability. It's really nice to see the children have that challenge for themselves, that they can do it. Today, we've been filming at a demonstration against what happened in Parliament recently, when our bill was talked out. Time ran out, so the bill fell. What do you think campaigners in this country should do now? In America, we had a similar experience before. And what we found was that the biggest barrier was attitude. That people got the wrong information. And I can understand why people here are frustrated and they want to have those programs and that the legislation was talked out. I can understand their frustration. The best way to do this is to involve the communities, to explain to the communities that this law is not radical. It is reasonable. It can work well. Private businesses are not required to take action that will cost lots of money or to lose their business. Not at all. What the bill says is that you must make reasonable changes so that all people have an equal access. It's important to work with business so they understand the need for legislation as well. Robert Mather. Also last month in Washington, Bill Clinton, the President of the United States, gave inspiration and encouragement to deaf people in America when he reaffirmed his administration's commitment to putting the Americans with Disabilities Act into practice. He was talking to students of Gallaudet, the Deaf University, after being made an honorary Doctor of Laws. He's introduced by the Deaf President of Gallaudet, King Jordan. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you. Over the years, pioneers have built Gallaudet, sustained by generations of students and faculty, committed to the richness and possibility of the deaf community and the fullness of the American dream. This school stands for the renewal that all America needs today. Because previous generations refused to be denied a place at the table simply because others thought they were different, the world is now open to those of you who graduate today. Most of you came here knowing you could be doctors, entrepreneurs, software engineers, lawyers, or cheerleaders. <laughs> because over the years, others spoke up for you and gave you a chance to move up, and you have clearly done your part. You have made a difference. You have believed in broadening the unique world you share with each other by joining it to the community at large and letting the rest of us in on your richness, your hearts, your minds, and your possibilities. For that, we are all in your debt. Perhaps the greatest moment in the history of this university occurred in 1988, when the community came together and said, we will no longer accept the judgment of others about our lives and leadership in this university. These are our responsibilities, and we accept the challenge. 
in days what was known as the Deaf President Now movement changed the way our entire country looks at deaf people. The nation watched as you organized and built a movement of conscience unlike any other. You removed barriers of limited expectations, and our nation saw that deaf people can do anything hearing people can but hear. That people's movement was a part of the American disability rights movement. Just two months after King Jordan took office, the Americans with Disability Act was introduced with the leadership of many, including my friend Tom Harkin. In two years, it became law and proved once again that the right cause can unite us. Over partisanship and prejudice, we can still come together. For the now more than 49 million Americans who are deaf or disabled, the signing of the ADA was the most important legal event in history. For almost a billion persons with disabilities around the world, it stands as a symbol of simple justice and inalienable human rights. I believe that being deaf or having any disability is not tragic but the stereotypes attached to it are tragic. Discrimination is tragic. Not getting a job or having the chance to reach your God-given potential because someone else is handicapped by prejudice or fear is tragic. It must not be tolerated because none of us can afford it. We need each other and we do not have a person to waste. The ADA is part of the seamless web of civil rights that so many have worked for so long to build in America. As your president, I pledge to see that it is fully implemented and aggressively enforced in schools, in the workplace, in government, in public places. It is time to move from exclusion to inclusion, from dependence to independence, from paternalism to empowerment. Whatever President Clinton may say at the D-Day commemoration on Monday, it could hardly be a stronger statement on liberation than that. Next Thursday is also another D-Day, decision day in the elections for the European Parliament. Don't forget to vote. Whatever the results, we'll be looking at what they mean for us in next month's program on Saturday, July the 2nd. Next week, Rachel Bastico will be here with a Deaf World Special, a profile of the deaf journalist, historian, globetrotter, and lifelong fighter against discrimination, Arthur F. Dimmock. Definitely not to be missed. Join us for that. month, the British Deaf News publishes the Sign-On Supplement with more information about our programs. For your free copy, send a large stamped addressed envelope to this address. Sign-On Supplement, British Deaf Association, 38 Victoria Place, Carlisle, CA1, 1HU. That's Sign-On Supplement, British Deaf Association, 38 Victoria Place, Carlisle, CA1, 1HU.